Today we will talk about uh, radiology and imaging of the chest in pediatric practice. As we have indicated earlier in our lectures, chest is very important and is very commonly taken in even small nursing homes in rural areas. So interpretation of the chest is quite important. And then when you are talking about the chest, it is conventional radiology that is the most important because most of the people encounter a PA view of the chest to begin with. That is the screening procedure. And uh, in this radiology and imaging of the chest, what are the structures that you see on a chest film? First, the soft tissues and the bony thoracic cage and then the mediastinum, then come to lungs, pleura and of course the diaphragm. When we talk of pleura, the costophrenic and cardiophrenic angles on both sides. And what are the various imaging methods? Of course, conventional radiology still holds good. If you take a general hospital or in a pediatric hospital, most of the films are of the chest. Nobody goes immediately to for CT or MRI of the chest. First film is the PA view of the chest. And of course, later on for fluid, say pleural effusion, even if the chest film may miss, they say up to 200 cc of fluid. But then ultrasonography helps to detect even a minimum amount of 20 cc of fluid in the pleural space. Same thing with pericardium also. And then we resort to CT, particularly for the mediastinal lesions, bronchiectasis, any calcification that is not seen in a conventional film of the chest. And then of course MRI. MRI we use rarely except for cardiovascular structures. For iota, great vessels, pulmonary artery, MRI is the best even without injecting any contrast medium. Of course, angiography earlier, before the invention of CT and MRI, we used to do lots of angiographic studies for iota, pulmonary artery, and great vessels of the iota. But then today we use much less than before. Radionuclear scan and PET rare, rarely use in uh, pediatric practice of the chest. And imaging techniques, Proscopy, of course, is important, although there is danger of radiation. So an expert radiologist only can spend minimum time on fluoroscopy and get maximum benefit to the patient. So fluoroscopy is essential, especially for the dynamic studies. And then conventional radiology, PA. Of course, in intensive care units, you have to take AP with portable units. Even then, a sitting film of the chest is always better. Because one, the child can take a deep inspiration in the sitting chest. And PA view of the chest can be taken in the sitting posture. And then lordotic view. See, the when you take PA view of the chest, what all we see is only about 40 to 50 percent of the lungs. The rest of it is obscured by clavicles, ribs, sternum, vertebral body, domes of the diaphragm. So it is important that we take not only PA with the chest, occasionally a lesion may be obscured under the clavicles. So a lordotic view is better. And then oblique views and of course lateral views to segmentalize which where the lesion is or to know whether it is in the anterior mediastinum, middle mediastinum or posterior mediastinum. Although an expert radiologist can tell on PA film only whether a mediastinal mass is in the anterior, middle or posterior part of the mediastinum. Or he can also tell where a particular abscess is in the superior segment of the lower lobe or in the anterior segment of the upper lobe. And then of course decubitus lateral is important particularly to know about minimal pleural effusions. I said already about 250 cc of fluid can be obscured behind the domes of the diaphragm. In which case, if you do not have an ultrasound on the side, a decubitus lateral view so that whatever fluid there is, it will layer out in the most dependent portion of the chest. So a decubitus lateral view is essential and easier to get while the patient is still in the radiology department. And ultrasonography, as I told earlier, sometimes we may use ultrasonography for mediastinal structures also. Earlier probes were not that sophisticated, so the ribs used to come in the way. But today, sophisticated ultrasonography, you can go through the intervascular spaces, 
and determine whether a mass is solid or cystic. Again, if the pleural effusion is there, you know what the amount of pleural effusion. Not only that, the advantage is you can put a needle under ultrasound guidance and aspirate the fluid to know what the nature of the fluid, whether it is pus, whether it is serous or chylus. And CT, MRI and PET rarely we use. Of course, CT more commonly used for lung lesions, for calcifications. Early detection is good for by CT. And then early calcification is also you can find by CT examination. And if there is a small cavity, you can find by CT examination. Today's with the multi slice uh, CT and spiral CT, you can even see the bronchi up to the terminal bronchioles. MRI, as I said, is rarely used only for uh, cardiovascular structures. And then we come to the soft tissues. You look at the film on your left side, the routine chest, but there is a mass. It looks as if it is in the anterior mediastinum or somewhere on the left side. But if you take the lateral view, there is a huge lipoma on the back. So it is important to take a lateral view. That is the importance. Otherwise, if you don't take the lateral view, you could have easily said a mediastinal mass immediately order for a, a CT or some other investigations. Now we come to the bony cage, thoracic bony cage. What are the various structures in the bony cage? Clavicles, ribs, spine, of course sternum. And what are the disorders that you can get? Why should we look at the bony cage in a chest film? Because several systemic disorders reflect on the bony cage. Sometimes on the ribs, sometimes on the sternum, sometimes on the clavicles. So it is important that you look at the bones before you proceed to look at the lungs and pleura. A systemic disorder may be multifocal or a focal also. So for example, take tuberculosis. You may find tuberculosis rib, costosternal junction in a PA with the chest and identify. And of course, local disease also. Incidentally, some local neoplasms or granulomas you can see by looking at the ribs. What are the systemic disorders that reflect upon the thoracic cage? Congenital or developmental, inflammatory lesions, such as use of the granuloma or histiocytosis X, infections, bacterial. Infections mostly, hemopoietic, anemias, leukemias, metabolic disorders, neoplasms, benign and malignant, and of course, miscellaneous causes. Bone congenital or developmental bone species. We can divide them into three varieties, purely sclerosing, purely lytic, and a mixed type, both sclerotic and mixed. What are the entities where you get generalized homogeneous increase in bone density. First of all, developmental osteopetrosis, a cousin of that is echinodysostosis, myelosclerosis, and then mastocytosis, Engelmann's disease, and idiopathic hypercalcemia that usually we see in children only. Among sclerosis and dysplasias, osteopetrosis or so-called marble bone disease is uh, should be diagnosed first. Diffuse sclerosis, there is no point in a differential diagnosis except this thought of a diffuse sclerosis, we may have to correlate with other clinical symptoms. Pycnodysostosis, as we said earlier, in pycnodysostosis also, you may find the diffuse sclerosis, but then how do you differentiate? Well, there are three, hypoplasia of the clavicles, which is not seen in marble bone disease. Of course, this is seen in craniocleidal dysostosis. Actually, people say that uh, pycnodysostosis is a hybrid between osteopetrosis and craniocleidal dysostosis. There are some features of osteopetrosis, namely diffuse growth of the bones, and there are some features of craniocleidal dysostosis, namely dysplasia of the clavicle, sometimes completely absent, sometimes segmentally absent. And also, if you look at the vertebral column, there is an anterior notching of vertebrae specific for 
pigno disasters. Of course, if you look at the mandible of the patient, obtuse angle of the mandible is seen in pigno disasters. That's how generally you diagnose pigno disasters. Piles disease, rarely seen, but still we have to consider. This is metaphyseal dysplasia, where lack of modeling of the tubular bones, particularly the metaphyseal part, not in the posterior ends of the ribs, distended, dilated, extended, posterior ends of the ribs, wide end, medial ends of the clavicles and ribs. That is classical of piles disease. Occasionally you may get cranial metaphyseal dysplasia, where is sclerosis of the bones also, calvarium. Then we come to melloreosis. It is not diffuse generalized. It is a localized osteosclerosis due to flowing type of hyperostosis. Parasteal ossification or calcifications are also may be seen, soft tissue calcifications in this entity. Then we come to idiopathic hypercalcemia where this is associated with other signs such as say pulmonary artery stenosis. The face is also is classical, they say, clinically. But the entity is Williams syndrome where hypercalcemia is there, dense bones are there, pulmonary artery stenosis is also there, segmental pulmonary artery stenosis. Then we come to an important entity which is quite relatively common, fibrous dysplasia. It could be monostotic, it could be polyostotic, it is Albright syndrome that is predominantly unilateral, particularly in the girls with sexual precocity. This is a syndrome with the, these components. And radiologically what do you find? The ground glass appearance of the matrix. The cortex may be thickened, but the matrix is ground glass. Occasionally it may calcify. Lytic area with a rind, the smoky matrix. Calcific matrix, rarely I said, in which case you call it a fibrochondrodysplasia. And thin cortex when aggressive, mixed osteosclerosis and also osteolysis is seen. Typical in the ribs it is quite common, of course in the skull bones it is most common, but then the ribs, look at the expansive nature of the lesion and look at the matrix, ground glass, first and second ribs, thinning of the cortex, this is classical of fibrous dysplasia and should not be mistaken for any neoplasm. Another elongated with an oblique view of the, the chest for ribs and elongated expanding lesion thinning of the cortex and the ground glass appearance of the matrix, classical appearance. And then I was mentioning to you about the craniocleidal dysplasia where we refer to in the case of pycnoid disastrosis, delay in ossification centers, absence partial or complete of the clavicles and midline defects. If you look at the skull, there may be wormy in bones, midline defects from uh, skull, the metaphyseal suture may be wide and uh, spina bifida you may find or absence of the clavicles, pubic symphysis may be wide because of the defect in the center. Quite common in a child, particularly the pediatric age, a patient comes with some symptoms, you take a PA view of the chest. And then the cardiac size looks enlarged. The right cardiac board is not seen. Immediately you should think of pectus excavatum. Look at the lateral view. The excavated uh, portion of the lower end of the sternum pushes the heart and it, the heart comes to the left side and looks enlarged. Not really it's enlarged. Occasionally you may find a benign murmur but that doesn't matter. Still it is pectus excavatum. Cornelia de Lange syndrome is a very rare case. Years ago, we have represented about uh, 20 cases of Cornelia collected all over the country in USA. And few segments of sternum, non segmentation of the sternum. Whereas you may get in Down syndrome, two ossification centers of the manubrium. Whereas here, there are the various segments of the manubrium sternum is not separate, it is fused with the body of the sternum. So, few segments of the sternum is characteristic of cornea de syndrome.
and then mucopolysaccharides are also it's a vague entity i don't want to go into the details of it because it itself forms a lecture harler markios and others and uh, mucolipidosis these are some of the mucopolysaccharide disorders we talk about osteogenesis imperfecta since it comes under the category of lytic lesions of the bone and this is characteristic that although there are four types of osteogenesis imperfecta but in children osteogenesis imperfecta the first three types are common of course the first type is lethal they may not survive up to the childhood osteogenesis imperfecta tarda represents later on in adolescent or later on in adult life and what are the characteristics of which is osteopenia the bones are gracile because this is imperfect osteogenesis and then multiple fractures ribbon like bones particularly as said gracile bones in the ribs you get ribbon like bones clinically you can make out then we come to the hemopoietic system hemolytic anemia particularly the sickle cell thalassemia and occasionally you may get a spherocytosis also and in sickle cell anemia characteristic bone changes particularly you can diagnose on chest film because you see the ribs a rib within a rib linear streaky sclerotic areas along the ribs and then if of course if you are fortunate to get the spine there is a notch like a defect at the center these are not small snorts in childhood generally you don't get small snorts and then there are multiple a strap like deformity of the articular margin of the vertebral body this typical is called the reynolds phenomenon because ren all the famous radiologist has described this phenomenon first and you can get the step like defect in the articular ends of the bones why because the central artery is supplying the central border of the articular margin is deficient and the rest of the ossification centers grow that's why because the ischemic process this does not grow and produces a defect mediterranean anemia hypermedullosis is the characteristic feature if you look at the ribs they are white because of the hypermedullosis deploy is hypertrophy at the cost of thinning of the ribs and then of course the occasion of them come with the congestive heart failure because of the anemia enlarged heart but still look at the bones they are characteristic this the cone view to demonstrate how hypermedullosis occurs in the anterior costal margins like rib knobs this is not rachitic rosary but the big knobs at the anterior costal margins due to hypermedullosis extramedullary hemopoiesis leukemia of course occasionally you can get a chest film and you see the periosteal reactions along the humeri because of the leukemic infiltrates in the ribs even in the clavicles classical a gibbous formation in a child in a thoracic spine with kyphosis and occasionally you can get a bilateral symmetrical paravertebral soft tissue swelling typical of tuberculosis of spine why should i say typical because tuberculosis is quite common in our country and then we see of all the infections involving the vertebral bodies say brucellosis e coli fungal infections but this is typical with a bilateral symmetrical paravertebral abscess associated with lytic changes in the articular margins of the adjacent vertebrae that is the most important there is a subtle if you look at the lateral uh, thoracic spine there is a subtle change in narrowing of the joint space mild erosions in the adjacent to vertebral bodies but then if you take a ct this saw small soft tissue swelling is apparent and you can correlate the paravertebral abscess with the lytic changes and the thinning of the articular cartilage into vertebral disc you can definitely say it is cox spine sometimes it is multifocal more than two vertebral spaces can be involved not only axial skeleton peripheral bones also may be 
Here again, on a lateral view of the chest, you may find a small erotic lesion. But you see, in a lateral view of the chest, the spine is not well seen because it's not focused on the spine. It is focused on the lungs. In which case, a CT really helps and it comes to our rescue in the diagnosis. Lytic lesion, why can't it be tuberculosis? Possible. But who said 90% of the tuberculosis of the spine produces a soft tissue swelling. That soft tissue swelling is not there. Not that eosinophilic granuloma does not produce soft tissue swelling. It may also produce, but not as big as the tuberculosis produces. This proved to be eosinophilic granuloma. And then local conditions, again, you know, you may get a, the patient may present with a bump, we take a P and lateral to the chest, central calcifications in the rib, typical of a chondroma, circular, nodular, arc-like calcifications. These are cartilaginous calcifications. No doubt it could be malignant, chondrosarcoma. There is no soft tissue swelling. There is no aggressive nature. So it is a benign chondroma. Occasionally you can get exhaustosis also from a rib. Now we have spent so much time on bones of the thoracic cage because often by pediatrician they will focus on the lungs and the heart rather than the bones. But then the bones may give you a clue to the entire diagnosis. Now we come to the mediastinum. Mediastinum, anatomically there is not much of a boundaries for the mediastinum, but radiologically in between the pleura the mediastinum lies superiorly, the thoracic inlet, inferiorly, the diaphragmatic opening. And that how the mediastinum radiologically is divided. There are several authors describing it various uh, superior, inferior, like that. But this particular classification helps us in the diagnosis. Whether it takes CT or HS film, it doesn't matter. And then this is divided into anterior, middle, and posterior. How? Look at the lateral view of the chest. If you take a line along the anterior border of the heart and then extend along the sternum, that is the anterior border of the mediastinum. Posteriorly, if you take a line along the posterior border of the heart and extend along the posterior margin of the trachea, all that in between these two lines is the anterior mediastinum. In other words, the cardiac silhouette is in the anterior mediastinum. That's why we often take PA view of the chest, not AP view. And then, apart from this line, if you draw another line parallel to the vertebral bodies, one centimeters beyond, or a half a centimeter beyond the anterior vertebral body, and in between those two lines will be the middle mediastinum. Beyond that line will be the posterior mediastinum. That's how generally we divide the mediastinum. It is helpful in the proper diagnosis. And if there is a mass, if there is a density in the anterior mediastinum, what are the possibilities? I always say four T's. Commonly, a thymoma. Thyroid in pediatrics is not that common, a substantial thyroid. But occasionally you may see a teratodermoid and a terrible lymph. Why do you call it terrible lymphoma? Apart from remembering four T's, if the hilar nodes extend all the way to the anterior mediastinum, then the prognosis is rather difficult. And then seminoma, you may get mesenchymal tumors, say lymphangioma, hemangioma, any mesenchymal tumors, lipoma, and occasionally aneurysms, aneurysm not that common in childhood. Pericardial cyst in the anterior and inferior mediastinum around the cardiophrenic angle, you may get a pericardial cyst. And of course, through the foramen of morgagni, herniations also can happen.